Imagine trying to win a drag race in a car that is stuck in fourth gear. The engine screams, but the wheels barely turn. You burn out the clutch before you reach 30 miles per hour. In the 1930s, this was the reality of aviation. We had built massive 1,000 horsepower engines, but we had no way to put that power into the air. We were trapping our pilots in a mechanical cage. Until one engineer decided to build a gearbox inside the propeller. To understand why Frank Caldwell is a mechanical genius, we must first understand the tyranny of the fixed pitch propeller. Throughout the 1920s, propellers were simple. They were twisted pieces of wood or metal bolted directly to the engine crankshaft. They were rigid, unchanging, and from an engineering perspective, they were a nightmare. Why? Because of angle of attack. Think of a propeller blade biting into the air like a screw biting into wood. If the blade is flat, fine pitch, it takes small bites. This offers low resistance. The engine can spin up to high RPMs quickly. This is perfect for takeoff, like first gear in a car. But once you are flying fast, those small bites are useless. The engine hits its red line, but the plane won't go any faster. You are revving the engine to death. So you twist the blade steeply, coarse pitch. Now it takes big dicks. It pushes a lot of air. This is perfect for cruising, like fifth gear. But if you try to take off in coarse pitch, the air resistance is so high the engine can't reach its power band. It stalls. You crash at the end of the runway. For decades, designers compromised. They built medium propellers. They were terrible at takeoff and terrible at top speed. They were mediocre at everything. By 1930, engines were getting bigger. 500, 600, 800 horsepower. But the planes weren't getting much faster. The fixed propeller was wasting 40% of the engine's potential energy. It was creating drag instead of thrust. Enter Frank Caldwell, the chief engineer at Hamilton Standard. Caldwell was obsessed with efficiency. He knew the solution. The pilot needed to be able to change the angle of the blades while they were spinning. But think about the mechanics of that. The propeller hub is spinning at 2000 RPM. The centrifugal force trying to rip the blades out of the hub is roughly 20 to 40 tons. How do you build a mechanism delicate enough to twist a blade by exactly two degrees, but strong enough to hold back 40 tons of violence? Caldwell didn't use gears. He used hydraulics. He designed a hub with a sliding piston inside it. He used the engine's own oil pressure. By pumping oil through the hollow center of the crankshaft, he could push the piston forward. Connected to the piston were mechanical linkages, counterweights and cams, attached to the root of each blade. When the pilot pushed a lever, oil rushed in. The piston moved, the blades twisted. It was a hydromechanical marvel. But the industry was skeptical. They said it was too heavy, too complex. Another thing to break, they said. Then came the test, the Boeing 247. This was the first modern airliner, all metal, retractable landing gear, two engines. It was designed to fly over the Rocky Mountains, but during testing, Boeing realized a horrifying truth. The plane was too heavy. With fixed pitch propellers, the engines couldn't generate enough RPM to lift the plane safely out of high altitude airports like Cheyenne, Wyoming. Boeing had spent millions, and they had built a turkey. They were about to scrap the project. Frank Caldwell showed up with his controllable pitch propellers. They bolted them on. The pilot set the lever to take off, fine pitch. He opened the throttles. The engines screamed to full RPM immediately. The blades bit the air with low resistance. The Boeing 247 leaped off the runway in half the distance. Once in the air, the pilot pulled the lever to cruise, course pitch. The oil pressure shifted, the blades twisted, the RPM dropped, but the speed increased. 
the plane cruised over the Rockies effortlessly. Caldwell saved Boeing, but he had done something much more dangerous. He had unlocked the cage. Suddenly, engine designers realised they could build massive, high-compression monsters. They could build the 2,000 horsepower engines needed for war, because now they had a way to use that power. But across the ocean, in Great Britain, the Royal Air Force was sleeping. They were designing a new fighter, the Supermarine Spitfire. It had the perfect aerodynamic shape, it had the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, but the British government, trying to save money, made a fatal decision. They fitted the prototype Spitfire with a fixed-pitch, two-blade wooden propeller. It was like putting wooden wagon wheels on a Ferrari. The test results were depressing. The Spitfire was sluggish on takeoff. It climbed slowly. Meanwhile, in Germany, the Messerschmitt BF-109 was flying with a licensed copy of Caldwell's variable pitch technology. The Germans could outclimb the British. They could dive faster. War was approaching, and the British were about to send their pilots into combat with one hand tied behind their backs. Frank Caldwell's invention was sitting on a shelf in America, while the fate of Europe hung by a thread. By 1938, Frank Caldwell's two-position propeller was the industry standard. It gave pilots two choices, takeoff, low gear, and cruise, high gear. It was a massive improvement, but it was still crude. It requires the pilot to manually shift gears. In a dogfight, a pilot is busy trying not to die. He doesn't have time to watch his RPM gauge and fiddle with a lever. If he dives, the engine over revs and blows up. If he climbs, the engine bogs down. Caldwell knew that for the propeller to be a true weapon, it needed to think for itself. Enter the constant speed unit. Caldwell didn't just want a gearbox, he wanted an automatic transmission. He designed a mechanical governor that sat on the nose of the engine. The concept was pure mechanical genius. Inside the governor were rotating flyweights, heavy metal balls spinning with the engine. Here is the mechanics of it. If the plane dives and the engine starts to speed up, the flyweights spin faster. Centrifugal force pulls them outward. This movement physically pushes a valve stem, which opens an oil line. High pressure oil rushes into the propeller hub, twisting the blades to a steeper angle, coarse pitch. The blades bite more air. The drag increases the engine slows down back to its target RPM. All of this happens instantly, automatically, without the pilot touching a thing. It was a continuously variable transmission for the sky. Whether the pilot was climbing vertically or diving at 400 miles per hour, the engine stayed at its peak power band, usually 2,850 RPM. The propeller was constantly adjusting, thousands of times a minute, hunting for the perfect bite of air. It was the ultimate efficiency. But in 1940, the British Royal Air Force had a problem. They didn't have it. June 1940. The Nazis have conquered France. They are staring across the Channel at England. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. The RAF has the Spitfire Mark I, but many of them are still fitted with the older two-position propellers, or worse, fixed-pitch wooden ones. The pilots are terrified. They know that against the German Messerschmitt 109, which has a fully automatic constant speed propeller, they are sitting ducks. The German plane can climb faster. It can dive without blowing its engine. The Spitfire pilot has to throttle back in a dive to save his engine, letting the German get away. June 24th, 1940, weeks before the major attacks. De Havilland, who licensed Caldwell's patent, gets a desperate call from the air ministry. Convert them, all of them, now. It is one of the greatest engineering scrambles in history. De Havilland sends teams of engineers to every RAF airfield in Britain. They don't have time to bring the planes back to the factory. They work on the grass, in the rain, under canvas tents. They have to drill holes in the engine bulkheads to run the new oil lines. They have to bolt the Caldwell governors onto the Merlin engines. 
They are modifying the most sophisticated fighter plane on Earth with hand drills and spanners, often while air raid sirens are wailing. They work 24 hours a day. They sleep under the wings. In just 54 days, they converted over 1,000 Spitfires and Hurricanes to constant speed propellers. The result was instant. The constant speed Spitfire could climb 7,000 feet per minute. But the biggest change was the dogfight. Now, when a German pilot tried to dive away, the Spitfire pilot didn't have to throttle back. He could push the nose down, keep the throttle wide open, and the propeller would automatically coarsen to keep the engine safe. He could stick to the German's tail like glue. The German pilots were shocked. A week ago, the British planes were sluggish. Now, they were performing manoeuvres that shouldn't have been possible. The 12 mile per hour increase in top speed was nice, but the ability to use 100% of the engine's power 100% of the time, that was the difference between life and death. Frank Caldwell's American invention, installed by British mechanics in a muddy field, had levelled the playing field. Caldwell had solved the takeoff. He had solved the dogfight. But as the war dragged on, bombers began to fly longer missions. They flew over oceans, and pilots discovered a new, terrifying problem with the propeller. If an engine died in mid-air, the propeller didn't just stop. He became a killer. It turned into a giant air brake that could flip a bomber upside down in seconds. By 1943, Frank Caldwell's constant speed propellers were on every Allied fighter. They were winning dogfights, but for the bomber crews flying B-17s and B-24s, the propeller had a dark side. When an engine was hit by flak and died, it didn't just stop. The rushing air hits the flat blades and forces them to spin. It's called windmilling, and it is terrifying. A windmilling propeller isn't producing thrust. It is a massive parasite. It acts like a giant air brake on one wing. The drag is so immense, it can pull the plane into a deadly spin, flipping it upside down. The dead engine didn't just quit. It tried to kill the rest of the plane. Frank Caldwell knew that the only way to save the crew was to stop the windmill. But the air forces on the blades were massive, tons of pressure spinning the dead engine. Caldwell needed a way to turn the blades 90 degrees, edge on to the wind. He called it feathering. Think of it like a knife. If you slap water with the flat of a blade, it stops dead. If you slice it with the edge, it slips through effortlessly. Caldwell designed a panic button in the cockpit. When the pilot hit the feather button, an auxiliary electric pump screamed to life. It bypassed the normal governor. It pumped high-pressure oil into the hub, forcing the piston past its normal limits. The blades twisted all the way to 90 degrees. They streamlined. The wind caught the edge, and the propeller simply stopped. The drag vanished. The effect was miraculous. A B-17 with two feathered engines could still fly. It could limp home across the English Channel. Without feathering, those planes would have spiralled into the ocean. Thousands of airmen returned home to their families solely because Frank Caldwell figured out how to make a propeller turn sideways. The war ended. The jet age began. Frank Whittle's jet engines didn't need propellers. They used internal turbines. For a moment, it looked like Caldwell's invention was obsolete. But the laws of physics are stubborn. Jets are fast, but they are thirsty. For short-haul flights and cargo, you still need the efficiency of a propeller. So, engineers took the jet engine and bolted a Caldwell propeller to the front of it. The turboprop was born. Look at a modern C-130 Hercules. Look at the Dash 8 that flies you to regional airports. They use massive, multi-bladed propellers. And inside the hub, you will find the great-grandchildren of Frank Caldwell's mechanism. Governors, counterweights, oil pistons. The computer controls it now, but the mechanics are exactly the same. 
The gearbox of the sky never went away. It just got smarter. Frank Caldwell is rarely mentioned in history books. He didn't build the engine, like Rolls-Royce. He didn't build the airframe, like Mitchell or Johnson. He built the link between them. He was the man who realized that power is nothing without control. Every time you see a plane take off, watch the propellers. Watch them bite the air. That is the invisible hand of Frank Caldwell, shifting gears so we can touch the clouds. The engine provides the muscle. The wing provides the lift. But the propeller? The propeller provides the grip. 